we go on with a discussion on the letter of Paul to Timothy. And now we look at chapter 4. You can see clearly, chapter by chapter, Paul is assisting this young overseer to have a chance to establish a good church, well run. And he is, he, has, he is telling me exactly how the church of Jesus Christ should be run and therefore setting an example for us today on how we can run a good church and how we can be a good leader. That's basically what the book is aiming at doing and establishing the various groups in the church and why you need to help them and feed them spiritually as a, as a leader. Verse 1 says, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times some were abandoned the faith and followed deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. This portion of scripture, it shows an example of people who started well but then departed from the faith. In <laughs> back to warning, warning uh, the young pastor, it is possible to start well. Move off from the faith and you start doing things that have nothing to do with godliness and, and biblical. It's interesting that now it's a big issue all over, but it, we are on the way from the beginning. So when you start thinking that because you are a Christian you cannot fall, where are you basing it from? When you start thinking because you went to a good Bible school, you cannot go take a tangent and move into an era. Which Bible are you reading? It means all of us, and especially those of us who are preachers, should understand the possibility that you can easily misread the scriptures and create a doctrine that's not biblically right. Uh, here they call it hermeneutics, the art of interpreting the scriptures, explaining them. They say whatever passage is written, you must first of all uh, understand what the passage is saying. Then ask yourself, as a second question, what the people who were the first readers of that letter, of that book, what do they understand with that? Not how you, you understand it, but how would they understand it? Only when you now can see the writer and the reader are in agreement, you now ask your third question, how does it apply to me now today? The trouble with all of us is that we read a portion and start applying to the situation without the, the number two step of trying to understand. Is what you are saying possible interpretation by the people who received the scriptures. Because the word of God cannot say to you something totally different from the intention of the writer. And I think that's really one of the things that we have to ask ourselves. And we have to do everything possible to ensure that uh, we don't go off. You know, we, we Paul is saying that the Church is the pillar of truth. That if you go on your own and you cannot be asked questions, you very easily become chaotic. That's why there should never be a church, like we were saying earlier in chapter 3, that has a leader, one person who cannot be questioned. Shouldn't exist. It's unbiblical. Paul, everywhere we went, created a body of leaders who can help each other, who can correct each other. 
So if you are the senior pastor or the bishop, and you don't have a committee that corrects you, that can ask you, that can overrule you, shouldn't you fear one of these days you'll come up with us with a, with a teaching and take the whole congregation as a target? That's one of the things you have to ask yourself. Is that, is that a possibility? Is that a fear that we, you should be worried about? And I think, yes, you are human. Remember, in order to be departing from the faith, the devil is not far from you. And every Christian is on the devil's case list. He wants you to either backslide openly or slide, side slide a little away from the truth. And you know something? If, you, if I'm going north directly, and you, you, move, you move away from it by 0.1 of a degree. In another four or five years, we'll be very far from each other. So it's important that you create structures as a group that helps that nobody can come at a tangent without being answered. There's nothing wrong with getting a dream at night and coming to share it with people. But you know, First Corinthians chapter 14 is saying, yeah, when somebody comes up with a prophecy or an interpretation or, or some message, the others are to weigh. So even if you believe the Spirit of God is the one who gave you that message, the Bible is still telling you, give the other people who are as spiritual as you a chance to weigh whether you really have from the Spirit of God. Is not the message of first letter, first letter of John chapter 4. Verse 1 to 4, which is saying, test the Spirit. In the process, you will be testing the Holy Spirit Himself. But He's the one inviting you to test Him, so that you are sure it is Him. So don't say, don't touch the Lord's anointed. In other words, the Lord's anointed cannot make a mistake. Paul wants Timothy to know there is a possibility as we progress towards the end, people will begin right and then they move away from from that and you can see if that has happened the one predicted here is where you forbid people from getting married and of course the Catholic church has done that if you look at the Catholic dictionary page 132 i quote the law of the roman church forbids persons living in the married state to be ordained and persons in holy orders priests to marry also a book, Faith of Our Fathers, page 328 says, Although celibacy is not expressly enforced by our Savior, the church felt it had duty to lay it down as a law. And yet, <laughs> the Bible already predicted that people who are moving away from the faith would do it. Say, Paul said it will happen. And the attack it happened. What have been the result? Many people want to be priests, but they also want to be married. In the process, they become priests, and they have side wives, and there are all kinds of scandals. What has been worse is in recent years is the whole issue of priests being accused of uh, sodomizing young boys who came to them for spiritual help. And now it's uh, there are cases all over the world of priests having done it. Of course, some may be erroneously accused, but some have, ad have admitted. Why did it happen? Because of something total and biblical being added. Something already predicted in the scriptures would happen. That as people moved away from the faith, they would stop people from marriage. Wow. How interesting. The verse 3 is saying, they forbade people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. But here we are discussing the first, the first example, which is Mary. So, my friend, who are you to contradict a written instruction of the scriptures, not to forbid people from marrying? I can choose not to marry, 
but you are not allowed by the scriptures to tell me not to marry. You know that's why for that to happen, you must go to the word of God as one of the many sources. But the evangelicals believe that's the beginning of departing from the faith. Where after the canon was closed, in other words, what the scripture was closed, you still think that something else can be said, that they can update what was in the scriptures. But actually, to contradict the scriptures is really moving off from whatever would have been allowed. You know, just so that you understand is not a new matter. Genesis 2.18 is saying, it is not good that man should be alone. So who is this contradicting the Bible and saying it's okay for priests all over the world not to, to be alone? It's not good that man should be alone. You know, the more close scandals have been of Catholic sisters claiming that they were playing wives to Catholic fathers and kind of implying they are being raped. It's not that because they opted to be single, went into the, into, to, to, the, to the order, whichever order it is, but then there is a priest who wants to use them sexually. And then one of them claimed that if you, if you get pregnant, you are forced to abort. Because what he was after is sex, not a child. But the Bible had already said originally, don't forbid marriage. Genesis 2 is saying, ah, God looked at Adam, after everything he had said so far was good, good, good. He said, for the man to be a Lord, not good. And of course, Hebrews 13.4 is saying marriage is a good thing. Since marriage is honorable among all, whether priest, not priest, whether tall or short, all of us, it's okay to get married. If you choose not to get married because you know yourself and you know some, some, some may be eunuchs by birth, the Bible tells us, you can't tell them to marry. But it's not somebody telling them not to marry. It is their condition. It is them who, who are saying, I will not get married. Because marriage is a good thing. And we know that there are, there, are, there, are, there are people who are serving the Lord and they are married. Who is among them? Matthew 8.14 talks of Peter's wife's mother lying sick. What does that tell you? Peter was married. And it's the same thing Paul says. Don't we have a right to go with a, with a wife like Peter does? That's clear. How would have come up with that, something contradicting? Because some claim Peter is the first pope and he had a wife. So what would have been the idea of forcing people not to marry? That's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 9.5. Cephas had a believing wife. You had a believing wife with, with her. Or he is saying, can't I have a right to have a believing wife as do suffers? So it's clear in the New Testament era, people are serving the Lord in the marriage state. And of course, Titus chapter 1 verse 5 and verse 6, and then 1 Timothy 3, 2, we are learning that the leaders, the elders of the church are to be husband of one wife. In other words, he came out clear, you should be married, but not to more than one wife. And if you have more than one wife already before coming to the Lord, then don't enter into the, into, into the leadership of the church. St. Joseph New Catholic Edition says, there is no question of a right to marry, of a right to marry. The apostles had that right. Priestly celibacy is a law as the law is of later ecclesiastical institution. But of course, because they, 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 they take the Bible as only one part, and the, the writings of the council, the church council, is equal to the, 
to the to the Bible, then they, they can contradict each other. Evangelicals believe you can you must be a prisoner of the sixty six books of the Bible, no more, no less. And if a pastor, your leader, says something that the scripture doesn't say, you have the freedom to say no. Why? Because Hebrews chapter one verse one to four is talking about it and saying in the last days you could hear various people. But in these last days, the Son has spoken and it's final. So, and Jesus is as the Word has spoken. So, if your pastor or your disciple is saying something you can't find in the Bible, you have the freedom not to follow him, not to walk with him, not to follow his way. Because you have the Bible here and you can read it for yourself. And, and I think that, uh, that will be something that is uh, important for you to look at. My prayer is that the Lord will help us on that matter of marriage to accurately see the dangers. You know, I had a friend of mine who, when we, when we were young people, told me, ah, since I can see when people marry, they are going to, they, 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 they divide their attention between themselves and their, their work of the Lord and the wife. I want to serve the Lord so much. I do, I'll, get, I'll get married many years later. But unfortunately, what I didn't understand my friend saying is because he already had a sister for a girlfriend whom they were planning to marry, but they wanted to postpone the wedding into the world, in our early 20s, into the, other, into the 30s, so that they can have a decade, or rather I didn't hear the sister had the man, he can have a decade of serving the Lord. You know, one day we were in a, in, on a mission together on a weekend away from, away from Nairobi preaching in one of the villages when he said, Ah, I have something to share with you. Sister so-and-so is pregnant. Why did that happen? How did it happen? Let's not go into that story. But the point is, the word of God is clear. It says, if you can't control yourself, get married. So to accurately refuse to marry so that you prove a point is to give the devil an opportunity to destroy you. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important. However, having said all that, let's be clear. The word of God allows people to be single. And there's nothing wrong with being single. If you have been called to singlehood, if that's the way God has created you, if that's where your interests are. If you, Paul says, if you're not burning, in other words, you don't have sexual, sexual desires to that extent, then stay single. Singlehood is supported by the scriptures. The, what is, the Bible is against is forcing singlehood. But if it is you as God to it, there's absolutely no reason why you cannot you cannot um, be in that state and actually serve the Lord. Actually, to be fair, if you choose to be married, there are several consequences that follow. Number one, First Corinthians chapter 7 is saying, a man who marries, must divide his attention between the Lord and the spouse. And, he, and Paul is not criticizing him, he's just noting a fact that if you are a truly a serious Christian, you cannot marry a woman and then abandon her. You must reduce the amount of time you are moving for missions in order to be available to your wife. So that needs to be understood. Maybe that's what the child did not want when they were creating the rule. But the Bible ex expects it. That once you are married, you must divide up your attention between you, between the work of the Lord and your spouse. And of course, the way you, people used to find you available everywhere, and uh, you had nobody to ask questions. 
we could ask you questions. That has to stop. Now you can't go for a mission without, without your spouse's permission. If you're a man, your wife has a right on you. If you're a woman, your husband has a right on you. And has a right on your time. So, we are not denying that, um, that the, the married people who are serving in the church will have to divide attention. But, if the alternative is for a man to claim to be single but he is burning, that's in contradicting the scriptures. You will not even do a good job. You try to manipulate the sheep or become a wolf in sheep's clothing. So the best thing would be, yes, reduce the time available for ministry, but yes, go the time you have available for ministry, you go happy, rejoicing, because you are coming from a good home. And that's the first thing that you must, of necessity, deal with. Of course, it's not just, the, the, just your wife. Normally, soon, children come along. And again, you are not encouraged to go to serve other people's children in church before you have sorted out yours. We read in First Timothy 3 that the first thing you must do is run your family well. Your children must be well managed. And of course, the time you are managing your children well, you cannot be available for the, for the ministry as much. So you must of necessity reduce the time well. You are helping other children in order to help your own children. And that will be something that, is a, that, that will, will have an impact on your availability of, um, in, in the ministry. But I believe that your impact will be higher because the things you are learning in dealing with your wife as you study the scriptures, you will understand how, what it means to be married. It then means, if you go to preach about marriage, you not just be talking theory. You are going to be talking practical things because you have gone, you have, you have struggled to do the things the Bible is saying. So when you talk to the people, you will be clearer because of that. All we are talking about the child, Sunday school program for your church if you are a pastor. If you have your own children, you now understand the needs the children have. And so you structure the church in a better way, all because you have your own children. You will not have known if you had remained single. You will not have known the challenges of bringing up children. Now you know. And so you can structure Sunday school in such a way that your children are also with other children are going to benefit better because you, you are a father of some children. But uh, related with it, when you marry, people tend to trust you more, especially the opposite gender. If you are a pastor and you are single and my wife is coming for counseling, wouldn't I have some, some reservations? But if you have a stable marriage, we know your wife, she's a happy wife. We know that you are clear about that marriage. You are committed to that marriage. We, we will tend to trust you more in your ability to relate with the whole church rather than with only people of your, people of your gender. And uh, therefore you can see the marriage is making you a better minister of the gospel because you now we trust you because we trust you you can relate better and you can minister minister better so for sure there is a benefit in you being 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 married and then the book of timothy is saying later that when you grow old your family should look after you now if you have Whatever, you are, whatever, whatever the church you belong to, one day you'll be too old to be a leader there. So, what happens to you? If you have a family, 
we know the family takes you over, even as the church, as the church hands you over to them. If you are single, it becomes a, an issue in itself that the church has to look look after. So you can see clearly all along there is a there, there, there is a reason why the Bible is telling us do not forbid marriage because ministries can be better with marriage. Ever heard of the saying, if you want to go quickly, go alone? That's true. So people who are ministering singly can do much more quantity of work. But the same statement says, if you want to make a big impact, if you want to go far, then go in a team. Let me now repeat. If you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to make to make the impact or move far, go with somebody else. So you can see clearly, if you go as a team, a man and a woman as a team to serve the Lord, the impact you make is much more long-lasting than if you are to go alone and uh, and not and not um, and not be and not and not, no, no, and, and not have somebody who can correct you. You know, a spouse is somebody who helps you in your ministry. Why? They listen. You know they love you. You know they admire you. You know they'll be embarrassed by your mistakes, so you know they cannot miss them. You finish talking, everybody's saying, wow, that was powerful. What a fantastic sermon. You go home, and you have a say, by the way, do you know that statement is strictly speaking, is not true? Which one? The one you said. Nobody else has told you. It's only your spouse who, who wait until you, the, nobody's around. They're just, a, just the two of you and will correct you. What happens? Next time you, you'll be better. So your spouse is, on, is kind of, of a homeschool project for you. If you don't have a wife, and people have the tendency, I've just described, of always telling the speaker how wonderful it is, you think you're a wonderful speaker, wonderful man, minister, of the gospel because nobody is telling you the truth how what they are how, how they are wishing you can look for another church or be transferred somewhere somewhere else but your wife or your husband will be very frank frank with you but in addition to that one of the one of the ministries people do is home ministry people visitation now if you're all alone and I'm coming to visit, it will be pretty difficult ministering to me or us who have come to visit you. But if it's a proper home with a husband and wife, as one of them is entertaining the visitors, the other one is making a cup of tea, as, as one is going to look for something, the other one is providing and they are talking. So the ministry goes on. It becomes a home-based ministry, which is not possible. Or it's not that easy if you really are going to be living as a single person. So I think I can understand clearly why Paul was saying it will be a deviation from the faith for somebody to accurately tell you not to get married. Let me read the, the portion again. The Spirit clearly says, that in latter times, some would abandon the faith. What's faith? The teachings of Jesus Christ. They will abandon it. What will they do instead? Follow deceiving spirits. So these things are from spirits. The cults come is an influence of the spirits. And they will finally start teaching things taught by demons. And yet, they are in the faith, but they are abandoning the faith. And of course, the Bible is telling us in verse 2, such te teachings come from hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared. So the Holy Spirit will be trying to correct you, but you are going to overrun and decide to continue to say something the Spirit is showing you 
is wrong. May we truly learn to stick with the scriptures.